chair the session and conduct the proceeding. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hemchand Krishna Prasad, a pediatric endocrinologist consultant in Mehta Hospital. He has over 10 years of experience and has numerous publications in national and international journals. And he received the Active Pediatrician Award IAPTNSC and he has co-authored co IAP textbook of pediatric endocrinology. Over to you, sir. I request sir to deliver the talk today. A clinical clue based recognition of endocrine disorders. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Without wasting time, over the next 20 minutes, we'll have a simple uh, overview. I think the timer is not on. Uh, the uh, overview of the clinic uh, based clues to the diagnosis of endocrine problems in children. So, to begin with, the first clue a pediatrician can get is from the growth chart. Please plot the growth chart. I think that has been re-emphasized and re-emphasized in multiple talks. This is the growth chart of a child with a normal growth. The height in the normal percentiles, weight in the normal percentiles, child with normal growth. Whenever you have a child's growth below the third percentile, both weight and height, with the weight being at a much more lower percentile compared to that of the height, you know that this child is growth deprived. And whenever you have weight affected much more than height, you know that the calorie depre depreviation, either because of a systemic disease or because of a primary nutritional disorder, is a culprit. However, when you have the reverse, you find that the child is very short for the population, but the weight is relatively preserved. Height is affected much more than weight. You know that the culprit is probably an endocrine disorder. So that is the first clue. On a growth chart, when you find both height and weight deprived or height are deprived much more than weight, you know that this could be an endocrine problem. Whenever you find a child who is not growing well, the height is just flat. There is absolutely no increment in the height. If the growth velocity is very poor, that could be the most important vital clue to the pediatrician to pick up an endocrine disorder. So from the growth chart, whenever you find the height is affected much more than weight and the growth velocity is poor, the clues a pediatrician gets is the child probably suffers from growth hormone lack, either suffers from thyroid hormone lack, or suffers from sex hormone lack. This is the first clue a pediatrician gets from the growth chart. Con coming, to nutrition, uh, coming to growth excess states, whenever you find the height and weight pushed forward, you know the culprit is the insulin. Insulin is a hormone which is capable of driving both the height as well as the weight forward. You're looking at a child with caloric excess, nutritional obesity. However, whenever you find the child's weight and height are on two different sides of the median, the weight is pushed ahead, the height is not pushed ahead, you know that this child has probably an endocrine disorder. There could be cortisol deficiency, there could be cortisol excess, there could be thyroid hormone deficiency. So this is the second important clue which the pediatrician gets from the growth chart to pick up a case of non-nutritional obesity because of a condition like hypothyroidism or Cushing syndrome. And whenever you find a discrepancy in terms of height being pushed much more forward compared to the weight, think what is the culprit. Usually sex hormone is a hormone which is capable of pushing the height much more forward compared to the weight. So whenever you have the height alone pushed forward without a genetic potential, see whether you're looking at a sex hormone excess state, a case of precocious puberty. I think the beauty of endocrinology is the dwell between physiology and pathology. Whenever you see the growth chart, remember your physiology words back. Whenever you have height pushed forward, think of sex hormone as a culprit. Whenever you have height and weight, on different sides of the median, think of hormonal states like cortisol, excess, thyroid deficiency, or genetic states. I think this slide kind of sums up how a pediatrician gets vital clues from the growth chart. Whenever you have a child with weight relatively preserved, but height affected much more, you're looking in terms of an endocrine cause for short stature. 
whenever you have height and weight on two different sides of the median, that is the child is obese but short, think in terms of an endocrine cause for obesity. Whenever you find the child is very tall but the weight is relatively preserved and the genetic factor does not explain it, think in terms of a sex hormone excess state that is precocious puberty. These are three vital clues a pediatrician gets from the growth chart. So first clue is plot the growth chart and interpret it properly. The second clue a pediatrician should look for is understanding the Tanner stage. Make a meticulous assessment of the Tanner stage and try to understand it. Basics, going back to physiology, whenever you have estrogen excess in a girl, you're looking at isosexual precocious puberty in a girl. Testosterone excess in a boy, you're looking at isosexual precocious puberty in a boy. Hence, whenever you see a girl with early breast budding, you understand the culprit is the estrogen. Go back to your physiology. The estrogen has to come from the ovary, either by itself or it has to come mediated by the pituitary gland. You're looking at either an ovarian cyst or a central precocious puberty. Whenever you have a crosstalk of hormones, girl exposed to early testosterone, you're looking at heterosexual precocious puberty. A boy exposed to estrogen, you're looking at heterosexual precocious puberty. So whenever you have a girl with clitoral prominence, whenever you have a girl with cystic acne, you're thinking in terms of heterosexual precocious puberty. The clue the pediatrician gets from making the simple observation is, does this child have CAH? Does this child have a virilizing ovarian tumor? These are the pivotal clues. Remember, testosterone is responsible for penile enlargement. The gonadotrophins, the LH and FSH, produced by the pituitary gland is responsible for testicular enlargement. Whenever you have a large testis and a prominent genitalia, remember the gonadotrophins are very high. You're looking at a central precocious puberty. The culprit is most likely the pituitary gland. It is producing a lot of uh, uh, gonadotrophins that is causing the testes to grow and that is causing the penis to enlarge. Whereas if you look on the left-hand side, you see an enlarged penis, but a normal prepubertal testis. So the testis is not the culprit in this child. Where is the sex hormone coming from? It could be CAH. A simple Tanner stage and its interpretation. I repeat it again. Both these children have a prominent penis, but the child on the left side has a small testis. Where is this androgen coming from? It could come from the adrenal gland. So the clue to the pediatrician is it could probably be a CAH. But you see the case on the right side, the testis is enlarged. So the, the, the testis is responsible for precocious puberty. That is the clue the pediatrician gets and he looks for a central cause. You know the normal pubertal sequence, telarchy, pubarchy, menarchy in girls, testicular enlargement, pubic hair enlargement, and growth spurt in boys. When the sequence is proper, you think in terms of a central precocious puberty. However, whenever you see the sequence is disturbed, you think in terms of a peripheral precocious puberty, non-HPG non axis mediated precocious puberty. You have pubarchy, but no menarchy. You have penile enlargement, but the testes are normal. You know something is not okay. So this child had bleeding PV, menarche, but no breast budding, no pubic hair. Is the sequence obeyed? Obviously no. So the clue is this child, the sequence is not obeyed, has a peripheral cause, was evaluated and found to be hypothyroidism. The, so the clue to the pediatrician is see whether the sequence is obeyed or not. If the sequence is not obeyed, you're looking at another peripheral cause. Similarly, this, this child has a large testis, but pubic hair is absent. Is the sequence obeyed or not? No, the sequence is not obeyed. The penis is large, the testis is large, but the pubic hair is absent. When the sequence is not obeyed, look at it more carefully. This child probably has hypothyroidism. So the message, careful interpretation of physiology is Tanner stage. Whenever you have early tilarche, you understand estrogen is the culprit. Is it simple tilarche? Is it precocious puberty? Whenever you have clitoromegaly in a girl, you have androgen excess state. The clue to the pediatrician is see whether this child has CAH, see whether this child has a virilizing tumor. When the child has menarche but no telarche and pubarche, you know that it could be a peripheral cause. Is it hypothyroidism? Is it an ovarian cyst? Similarly, boys, you have frequent erections, enlarged penis, but the testes are small. So where is this androgen coming from? It is probably coming from the adrenal gland. You're looking at a child with CAH. But whenever you have enlarged penis, erections, and large testes, you know that the pituitary is the driving force. Have a low threshold to perform an MRI. I think the beauty of all what we have said is none of them involves a, a laboratory test. I think that makes the topic even more pertinent, clinical clue-based diagnosis of endocrine disorders. 
plot the growth chart and interpret it properly, understand the Tanner stage. The third clue for the pediatrician, diabetes suspicion early. People talk of COVID pandemic, people talk of dengue epidemic. I think diabetes is, is, is so prevalent and it's so common. I think all practitioners will definitely agree with me. Whenever the child wakes up in the night to pass or drink water, requiring more than one pampers, requiring one pampers suddenly requires more than one, increased bathroom usage, previously drinking one bottle of water now requires both. Don't hesitate, do a test. What test to do? Simple basic test, a urine routine, random blood sugar and HbA1c. Even a simple urine routine will give you a lot of valuable clues. Whenever you have glucose urea, you remember physiology, whenever your blood levels of glucose cross a particular threshold, then only you have glucose urea. So when you have glucose urea, be alerted. When the urine routine also shows ketone, you are impendingly looking into a child going into DKA. So I think urine routine, random blood sugar more than 200, HbA1c more than 6.5%, you should immediately refer this child or consider early initiation of insulin therapy. So the three important clues, plotted the growth chart, understood the Tanner stage, diabetes has been suspected early. Number four, head, head to foot examination meticulously. When you have a child with goiter, with prominent eyes, tachycardia, hypertension, exophthalmos, you know the diagnosis is Graves' disease. When you have a goiter that is firm, irregular and enlarged, you know it is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, autoimmune thyroid disease. When you have a smooth goiter, hearing defect, intellectual defect, you know it is a dishormonogenesis, head to foot examination. When you have a child with precocious puberty and caffeolate spots, you're looking at McCune Albright syndrome, peripheral precocious puberty. A pigmented child with low sugar, you're looking at a child with probable CAH. A child with gynecomastia, you're probably looking at a pathological cause. If there is infantile genitalia, anosmia, abnormal fundus examination, genital ambiguity, cryptorchidism, you're looking at a pathological cause for gynecomastia. When there is nipple discharge and gynecomastia, you're thinking in terms of a prolactinoma. When you have a goiter and a gynecomastia, you're looking in terms of a thyrotoxicosis. Typical phenotypic, the cherubic facies and the broad forehead and an infantile looking child thinking in terms of growth hormone deficiency. Single central incisor, you're looking in terms of a hypopituitarism. Infantile genitalia, undescended testis, the clinical clue for the pediatrician in a short child is hypopituitarism. Midline defect, cleft palate, the clinical clue to the pediatrician is hypopituitarism. Blue sclera, recurrent fractures, short stature, the clue to the pediatrician is osteogenesis imperfecta. Wide carrying angle, a webbing of the neck, a knee -wide, Short girl child, the clue is Turner syndrome. Strie and obesity, the clue to the pediatrician is Cushing's. Polydactyly, night blindness, severe acanthosis, hearing defect, syndromic obesity. Almond shaped eyes, hypotonia, and you have infantile genitalia, learning disability. The clue to the pediatrician is Prader Willi syndrome. Obese child with voice change, hirsutism. You are looking in terms of androgen excess state. Obese child with excess hair growth in androgen dependent areas, you're looking at probably an evolving polycystic ovaries. Obese child with severe acanthosis, you're looking in terms of an evolving juvenile type two diabetes mellitus. So you, you learned how to, you, you learned the value of plotting the growth chart, understanding the Tanner stage and interpreting it properly. Diabetes suspicion early, doing a head to foot examination. Number five, undressing the child. Undressing the child, look at the genitalia. You see a child with severe hypospadias, bifid scrotum. So there has been some androgen deficiency in the crucial phase of development of this genitalia. So the to clue to the pediatrician is, think of androgen deficiency during intrauterine differentiation. Does this child have ambiguous genitalia, DSD? That is the clue the pediatrician should be alerted to. Whenever you have an apparently girl, female genitalia with a very prominent clitoris without palpable gonads, you know that this girl baby has been exposed to androgens. The clue to the pediatrician is this baby is exposed to androgen. So what is the important androgen excess state in a girl baby, which has to be treated immediately? CAH. The clue to the pediatrician when she sees a clitoromegaly in a newborn, think in terms of CAH. Labial fusion. Early androgen exposure is responsible for labial fusion. Clitromegaly, labial fusion. The clue to the pediatrician is 
androgen excess state may be CAH. Small penis, you have a small penis, undescended testis. The clue to the pediatrician is, is it gonadotrophin deficiency? See, by the time the gonadotrophins take control of the sexual differentiation, the gonad is already differentiated. So they may not have a hypospadias, but they may have micropenis. So the clue to the pediatrician when he sees micropenis, undescended testis, please think in terms of hypopituitarism, gonadotrophin deficiency. Remember, these children may have an underlying cortisol deficiency, thyroxine deficiency, which is more important than uh, uh, treating the growth hormone or the other axis. So this child has to be looked into very carefully and meticulously. So the clues and its interpretation. Clitoral prominence and labial fusion in a girl child. That's a clue. Clue for a CAH in a girl child. Bifid scrotum and severe hypospadias is a clue for androgen deficiency. It is for, is it 46 XY DST? That should be the thinking point. And the last clue, as far as the genitals is concerned, micro penis, small penis with or without undescended testis. The clue is to a probable gonadotrophin deficiency. Evaluate for hypopituitism. So we saw the importance of undressing the child. Next, we come to the vital signs. I think that has been extensively dealt in the previous quiz. Any child with hypertension and hypokalemia, hypertension and alkalosis, hypertension which is severe, hypertension with, with or without pigmentation, ambiguous genitalia and pubertal problems, always think whether the adrenal gland is a culprit. Hypertension with hypokalemia, hypertension with pigmentation, hypertension with early pubic hair and clitoromegaly, always think in terms of an endocrine pathology. Hypertension with severe end organ damage, hypertension with headache, sweating, and palpitation. Think in terms of adrenal medullary pathology. When, they, when it is severe, require more than one drugs, better to evaluate for adrenal medullary hypertension. So you measured vital signs. Auxiliary point of care testing clues. So point of, this may not be a absolutely physical examination, but the point of care testing and screening have kind of become a continuum of physical examination. Whenever you have hypoglycemia that in the newborn period, especially that requires a high GIR and that is persistent lasting for more than seven days. Think in terms of an endocrine cause. Remember hypo, uh, hypoglycemia and ketones are like husband and wife. They always go together. When you have hypoglycemia, ketones should get elevated. When you have hypoglycemia with negative ketones, think in terms of uh, hyperinsulinism. Ketone testing meters are very much available. Practitioners can equip their centers with this meter. It can be very useful one fine day. Whenever you have a severe hypoglycemia that requires a high GIR, hypoglycemia that lasts beyond seven days, hypoglycemia that is associated with negative ketones, the clue to the pediatrician is, is it endocrine? Hi, your monitor showing features of hyperkalemia, a pigmented child, this is again a clinical pointer to you to evaluate this child for adrenal insufficiency. And coming to the last clue, we saw the importance of plotting of a growth chart, understanding the tanner stage, diabetes suspicion, head to foot evaluation, undressing the child, vital signs, auxiliary point of care testing, and interpreting the screening meticulously. What is that? Remember, an asymptomatic newborn, I think these are two conditions where clinical examination can fail us we have to go in for screening. Number one, congenital hypothyroidism. Number two, salt wasting crisis of salt losing type of CAH. I think screening has to be performed. And how to perform and how to interpret the screening guidelines have been very, very, very clearly issued. The Indian Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology says either heel trick or caught TSH more than 20. If it is present, please look at this baby more carefully. The recent Indian Pediatrics 2020, there is a statement of cutoffs of 17 OHP for Indian babies, both sick and well. The, the large number, which you have to remember, is 37.5 nanomoles per liter, published in 2020. So these are the two things that you have to keep in mind. So I'm just going to come back, and this is my last slide. So I'm just going to link my take-home messages with the... Remember the two stars, the Pudue Pedicon, very beautifully described logo. There are two stars in this, the two stars for a pediatrician to make endocrine diagnosis. Number one, Tanner stage. Number two, growth chart. Remember Puduvai, plot the growth chart, understand the Tanner stage, diabetes suspicion early, head to foot examination, undress and look into the genitalia, vital signs including BP, auxiliary point of care testing clues from CBG and ketone meter, 
interpret the screening of CAH and congenital hypothyroidism judiciously. These are the valuable clues which a pediatrician gets to make endocrine diagnosis. Remember, I think whatever I have said over the last 20 minutes, physiology and pathology get very, very well amalgamated in pediatric endocrinology. It's a very beautiful amalgamation of pediatric physiology and pathology like 2020 and 2021 has been, uh, has been amalgamated in this logo. And you all of us would be, wave, would be in a wave of contentment of making a proper endocrine diagnosis. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I just try to put the logo in this talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was very thoughtful. I now request the chairperson, Dr. Radhish Sharmila, to hand over the memento to the speaker, Dr. Hemchand Krishna Prasad.